Okay, so I've got the man, the legend, the best password cracker in the world. Yeah, one of one of one the of the best password crackers best. in the world with me. Certainly the most prolific. Jeremy Gosling. And uh, it's uh, Saturday, August uh, 13, we're in uh, Las Vegas. And um, passwords contract at B-Sides have been completed su complete successfully. Uh, Jeremy initially had to cancel coming to Vegas and cancel his talk. Very last second, he was able to make it. He <laughs> pretty much came running into the room <laughs> <laughs> with a couple of notes on your phone. Yep. Uh, to do uh, your talk, passwords, but make it nihilism. That's right. And I remember, <laughs> I remember seeing the abstract and like, okay, I'm clueless, <laughs> <laughs> but I know this is gonna be good. <clears throat> so I, I, again, just the title, Jeremy. <laughs> what the hell? Well, <laughs> so uh, um, like I mentioned in my talk, like this was just kind of a seed that's been brewing in my head for a while. Um, mostly kindled by um, routinely being pulled into threads on Twitter, um, arguing about password length, password complexity, um, you know, websites limiting the number of characters you can input. And <clears throat> uh, it started to become apparent to me that we have a problem within a particular niche of the information security community where people don't really know how to threat model. Mm -hmm. And from there, the seed kind of grew into like, well, let's just actually threat model mm -hmm. password security mm -hmm. from both an organization's perspective and a user's perspective. <laughs> and uh, the results, um, many people aren't very happy about. Uh, <laughs> well, the, we'll the, get back to that one. Yeah. We'll get back to that. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, for how long? Because again, I gotta say, you know, I thought it was friggin' brilliant. Yeah. Uh, you, without spoiling what's coming in the next couple <laughs> of questions, but you know, for how long have you been thinking about this? Or as you say, you know, yeah. you pulled into th uh, Twitter thread <laughs> after Twitter thread. I mean, for yeah. how long has it been like cooking up there? Um, you know, when I was uh, researching this talk a little bit, um, I was finding tweets where I'd kind of mentioned things along this line going back to as far as 2017, mm -hmm. um, without naming any particular names on Twitter, a certain individual who liked to routinely pull me into these kind of arguments. I realized that, you know, this was becoming a pattern <laughs> and, uh, well, well, well so, it's a thing, you know, when, you know, when, yeah. You've been doing this for, for many years. I've been doing mm -hmm. this for many years. And I, I guess we've had our fair share and then some being pulled into all kinds of discussions. It's absolutely true, yeah. <laughs> I think we can say that not all, all of them are just equally productive. Uh, yeah, well. but, you know, uh, it, it being social media, I can't. I can't help but to get engaged. <laughs> you know, my wife tries to get me to ignore them sometimes, and I'm just like, no, someone's wrong. Yeah, hon, I'm, I'm coming to bed, but just, just somebody I need to correct on Twitter. Exactly, that's exactly right. I, I've been that, there before. That happens like once a week. <laughs> <laughs> once a week? Well, that, that's not much. Well, uh, for the big threads. You know, <laughs> for the small stuff, yeah, that's yeah, that's like daily. But it's all the time. The big threads, you know, those mm. those are at least once a week. But, uh, oh, so, so again, back to this uh, threat modeling. I, yeah. I, I, you know, well, I usually say that the people they 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 are at least not you know uh, aware when they are actually doing any kind of risk analysis, but also mm -hmm. threat modeling is. I mean, how man actually does that and how many how do you know <laughs> how to you know probably do it at all no i mean you're absolutely right and um it's something i had personally failed to consider because mm -hmm. threat modeling and risk management are two areas that come rather intuitively to me mm -hmm. um it's just sort of the way my brain kind of naturally thinks and processes information right but I've come to learn that it's not intuitive to a lot of people. And in fact, for many people, threat modeling is a learned skill. Mm -hmm. um, 
You know, in fact, recently in a job interview, I was asked where I learned how to threat model. <laughs> and I, was, I don't have an answer for yeah. that, yeah. you know, but, you know, I can tell you that I'm good at it. <laughs> yeah, you're so, good at it. Okay. Yeah. But so, so what you did, you know, held, you know, live on stage in, in front mm -hmm. of a live audience, you said, no, you, you know, let's do a threat model right here, right now. So yeah. what was it that you did? Well, I, I, I knew that if I just presented a threat model, that I already I already knew that the topic of the you know the talk was going to be highly controversial mm -hmm. and indeed it was the feedback I received on Twitter was like you know it's a very controversial talk <laughs> um, but I knew that just presenting the threat model and talking about it wasn't going to be enough to convince people mm -hmm. of what I was thinking they had to see it for themselves in action mm -hmm. so instead of me coming up with the threats I had the audience come up with the threats mm -hmm. right and. You know, and of course, they, the, the people in attendance of the talk came up with threats that I hadn't even considered. There were some interesting ones, such as the uh, gentleman who suggested um, a service provider selling your plain text passwords as mm. part of, you know, normal ad network, you know, type information. Yeah. I, I didn't even consider that, you know, mm. but... No, I mean, you, it, you ask, you know, like, yeah. how can the bad guys, how can they basically obtain passwords? And we listed yep. everything from Every single email attacks to injection attacks to physical mm -hmm. attacks to, you know, God knows what. Right. Yeah. And that's the whole basis. You know, that's the whole point of the threat model, right? Mm -hmm. Is you have to enumerate all the possible threats, mm -hmm. right? And then measure the risk and then, you know, come up with the mitigations. Yeah. And in this case, the traditional advice that we've been giving with regards to password security doesn't match the threat model. Yeah, but so, so, I mean, we listed all these threats on how to obtain passwords, and then you basically said that in which of these cases will length mm -hmm. and or complexity help you? Right. So I remember when I attended my first passwords con in Oslo back in 2012, you know, the big push was for length over complexity, right? Yeah. And that's and that's kind of been the uh, the uh, approach that we've been pushing is that length matters more than complexity. Yeah, and I and do and not that's disagree. That's the standard as well now. Right. And it, yeah, exactly. And I don't disagree with that. The problem is we've always approached the presumed threat model for password security to be how can we make passwords difficult to crack. Mm -hmm. And when you step back and look at the entire threat model, the whole picture of all the threats to passwords, right? Password cracking, and I say this as a password cracker, only comprises about that much of the possible threats. Mm -hmm. So we put all this focus on creating passwords that are hard to crack when that's not even really what the biggest threat is to passwords. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And People just sitting there and like, you know, you went through the list of all the different, you know, attack scenarios or threats that we came up with, like mm -hmm. injection attacks and mm -hmm. uh, SQL injection uh, or, you know, uh, phishing attacks and so on. And you asked us for each and every one, <laughs> will length or and or complexity help us? And the basic answer to those questions, to those different scenarios was, was no, it won't help you. No, in the majority of cases, neither length nor complexity actually mitigates the threats in the threat model. Hmm. Um, there are a few where it does, you know, and that's uh, specifically things like cracking the hashes, right? Length and complexity does help defend um, against that threat. Hmm. But for the majority of the places where credentials are being compromised, right, such as, you know, man in the middle or phishing or you know, um, any of those real world threats. And keeping in mind that from a user's perspective, we're supposed to assume that the service provider is storing the password in plain text, in which case password cracking doesn't matter anyway. So we still know that passwords can be stored in, in plain text. And I, I hate saying this, but <laughs> it, it, you know, they might actually claim they have a good reason for doing so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no. Um, some services you know, intentionally store the password in plain text without any password hashing. Um, or, you know, they may inadvertently be storing them in plain text through the use of telemetry or o overly verbose logging, logging the passwords. And even then, you know, some organizations um, and service providers simply just silently truncate your password. Mm -hmm. You know, you may think that you're inputting a, you know, 
72 character password and it's mm. getting truncated to 16 characters mm. you know so and, uh, the, and i mean from from you know from 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 us knowing each other now for more than 10 years since we met yeah. at passwords con i mean how many times haven't we seen all this you know weird stuff about truncating passwords silently yep. or cutting off spaces at the beginning beginning at the end which is uh, i guess still an ongoing discussion as an example right out emojis or whatever you're trying to do yeah or simply uh, normalizing the string by lower casing all the characters to making it you know case insensitive like yep. <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff that people are doing to passwords before hashing them that hmm. we don't really talk about a whole lot so you know you may think you have a long complex password but you know, your service provider has truncated to 16 characters, lowercased all the characters, removed the emojis, <laughs> replaced all the special characters with pound signs. <laughs> you know, like you just, you never really know what's happening on the back end yeah. until you find out what's happening on the back end and then you're, you're surprised. <laughs> so, so here I am, uh, you know, uh, passwords has been my passion mm -hmm. for like more than 22 years now. Uh, and I've been doing passwords con since 2010. I mean, you came to Oslo in 2000. That's, that's almost 10 years ago now. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and, uh, you know, I was sitting here listening to you um, in the room and you just say that for man in the middle attacks, it doesn't really help you at all if you have mm -hmm. long or complex passwords. Yeah, for of course. phishing, you just give it away. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's long or complex. Also right. stuff like that. And, you know, I, I was just like, before I ended up on the floor crying, <laughs> for fuck's sake. Uh, I, I, again, dude, like, you're a good friend of mine. That, that's the way I see this. But, dude, did you just freaking kill passwords, Con? I mean, no. is there any point in continuing this discussion? No. And, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a password cracker and a password cracking tool author, and I love passwords, too. You mm. know, it's it's... For me, it's mostly about the hunt and you know the thrill of the sport and hmm. you know. But I don't think I've killed passwords, Con. I mean, there's still you know lots of areas to be discussed, not just with passwords, but with you know digital authentication and all sorts of forms. But hmm. um, you know the the biggest thing is really shifting the mindset of what we teach users, hmm. and that's really what passwords Con's been all about. Yep. Is how do we educate and train the users, you know, to be more effective, to, you know, better engage in their digital world, you know? And the best way we can do that is to reduce the complexity. Hmm. And I think that's what I've done is I haven't killed passwords con, but I've reduced the complexity for users hmm. by telling them, don't worry about making a long password. Don't make you, don't worry about using a complex password. Hmm. Just use a unique password. But for, for all the CISOs out there, for all the developers that are to do any kind of security design and implementing anything that has to do with passwords and digital authentication, mm -hmm. uh, and also you know, back again to the risk analysis, the, the threat uh, analysis of this, an advice that you you know you look straight into the camera, like and like <laughs> this is something you need to learn and this is something you need to remember. Is there anything new that you know now you would like to? sort of tell people? Users, use a unique password for every site and service. Organizations, developers, you still need to do things like proper password hashing because in the event your password database is compromised, at a minimum, you don't want the liability of your user's passwords being cracked and reused on other sites and services in a credential stuffing attack. And that's Jeremy Gosney saying that. <laughs> There's no point in trying to argue against him. Trust me. <laughs> okay. Anything else that you know we can do, like the well, you and I, or the passwords community, or is there something that we should say to uh, Jim Fenton and, and for you know, like <laughs> uh, uh, upcoming new versions of the NIST standard, or, or anybody else out there? You know, for the hardcore group of people. <laughs> well, for the hardcore group of people, um, yeah, I mean, I think in order to, you know, help reduce that complexity for users and for organizations who are impl implementing things like password complexity policies, a little bit of the dialogue does have to change. Now, there isn't a problem here with my suggestion of using unique passwords, mm -hmm. and that is it's difficult to implement a control. Right. It's easy to implement a control for length. 
Hmm. It's a little bit more challenging to implement a control for complexity. I mean, of course, you can just check for basic, like, does it have the required numbers of characters and all that stuff. Yeah, these simple but controls. As far, the simple controls. But as far as, like, measuring password strength, which I still maintain is an unsolved problem in hmm. 2022, um, you know, that's, that's difficult, but people are still, you know, implementing solutions for that. Hmm. There isn't really a good way to implement a control for ensuring people are using unique passwords. Mm. So that is an unsolved challenge yeah. that, you know, maybe some brain power could be applied to. Uh, and I, 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 I still remember back in 2013 when you had convinced me to do PasswordsCon here in Vegas. So we did yeah. it for the first time at the Golden Nugget. <laughs> I remember that one of the talks that people were there was, you know, had a very simple title of measuring password strength. And, yeah, and I and I do remember also, you know, telling the entire audience like, you know, I don't want to have friggin' fist fights in here <laughs> because this topic and this talk is going to be tough, and we're still not done with that discussion. No, not even close. Um, there has been some really novel approaches to that problem. Um, I mean, Dropbox has uh, that one library the. ZXCVBM. Yeah. Thank you. I could not remember the letters in that order. <laughs> but yes, I mean, that's a pretty clever library. Hmm. Um, but I mean, all of them fall short because there's a lot, in a lot of ways, you can't really know. Uh, like, let's say, like, my, one of my favorite tricks that I like to do to fool those password strength meters is to input like a Windows XP CD key. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. Technically, it's random, mm. but thousands of us have a committed to memory from when we used to pirate Windows XP, <laughs> right? And it's <laughs> and it's a word that's in most of our word lists, yeah. you know. But every password strength checker will tell you, like, oh yeah, good to go, mm. you know. Yeah. So, um, like I said, it's wholly an unsolved problem. Um, I think one of the best ways to try to tackle it, and I'll probably be shot for using this buzzword, mm. but Machine learning hmm. is, I think, an appropriate application of this problem because what we could probably do, and I know some have attempted this, but um, basically if we can train a model what a password looks like that we can crack, hmm. then we can use that to you know, score the confidence of the probability of us not being able to crack a password, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, Jens Stoib from Adam from Hashcat yep. came up with a really unique approach um, that he shared with me where he used the Markov tables from Hashcat to basically determine the position where a password would fall in the Markov table uh, um, to determine if it's crackable or not. Cool. So I thought that was pretty cool. That's that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Again, this is passwords con, but for all these years, I mean, we've had anything from linguists and psychologists to well, uh, academic professors and PhD yep. students to hardcore cryptographers, uh, including the invent of AES and the mm -hmm. SHA-3 algorithm speak at passwords con. But we've also had talks about biometrics and all kinds of two-factor authentication. Now, at, you know, in 2022, at B-Sides password contract, we even had a panel discussing FIDO Web or then. Right. So again, the question for the master cracker himself. <laughs> what about multi-factor authentication or two-step verification or two-factor authentication mm -hmm. or whatever we want to call it, be it SMS or email or TOTP, uh, biometrics, and up to and including FIDO Web or then. Are we, have we now reached a stage where we have to do two-factor authentication? absolutely everywhere uh, and the obvious question uh, that i hate to ask will we ever get rid of passwords well let's address the last one first so will we ever get rid of passwords maybe eventually but the fact remains despite the drawbacks of passwords they're still the cheapest and easiest form of, of authentication to implement yep so you know while they're probably not going away in the next five or ten years. I think eventually. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I, well, I usually tell people, Jeremy, sorry for breaking on this one, <laughs> but I say that not in my freaking lifetime. And I, I do. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to put an I, expiration I have, date on your life. <laughs> <laughs> I do have more than five to ten years to go, Jeremy. Okay, but point no, again, fair, yeah. fair enough. No, mm -hmm. no. Um, I, I have a lot of hope for Fido. Hmm. Um, so. 
I fought password managers for a really long time. Mm. If you remember, I probably didn't adopt one until 2013, 2014. Mm. And the reason why is that even as a security expert, the thing I hated more than insecurity is being slowed down additional steps added to my workflow. Mm -hmm. And for years, a password manager was a separate application to open, type in a master password, copy, paste, (laughs) you know, that's, Mm -hmm. it slowed me down Mm -hmm. despite, you know, the fact that using a unique password per account was encouraged and, Mm -hmm. you know, using random passwords instead of human generated passwords was, you know, superior. Mm -hmm. I still fought that because, well, I'm lazy. Hmm. And I want to do things as fast and as efficiently as possible. I did not start using a password manager until password managers caught up with my expectations for integration and reducing steps from the workflow. Now, I love password managers because they actually make my workflow faster. Hmm. And that's where things like multi-factor authentication have to get. Hmm. Right now, multi-factor authentication adoption is low. Yep. because it introduces an additional step. It's a pain in the ass. It's a, it's a hassle. It takes time. And yes. It takes time. Mm-hmm. And people don't want that. People mm-hmm. don't like that. Even I don't like that. I think it's a pain in the ass. Like, oh, enter your, you know, TOTP. Well, shit. Okay. Uh, let yeah. me, let me stop. Let me open this. Mm-hmm. And like, yes, you know, it does have security merits, mm-hmm. but it comes at the expense of user patience, mm-hmm. you know? So, you know, I think that s- the solutions around multi-factor authentication will have to find a way, as password managers did, to become less obtrusive, more transparent, and reduce the, wor- the steps in the workflow rather than add to them. Hmm. That's when you'll finally see widespread adoption. Hmm. And well, I think Fido is pretty close to that with the push, the push notifications. Yeah. Right? So, no, but uh, also, you know, I mean, if you if you do the the very simplest of uh, demonstrations of Fido, uh, web uh, There are several web pages that can do this. Uh, one mm-hmm. that I've been using is, uh, you know, I can do it on a cell phone. Mm-hmm. And I can show you that, you know, create an account. You just type in a username and you say create account. And mm-hmm. you, uh, well, when I do it, I just verify my account or register or whatever you want to call it by using Face ID on my iPhone. Mm-hmm. And then the account is created. There's no pin, there's no password, nothing right. like that. Yep. And then I can just click login. I enter my username and I say login. I look onto my phone again and I'm in. Right. And this seems, you know, again, I have to say this, this feels incredibly easy to do. Mm-hmm. But there's one, well, one of the things I'm really wondering about is this one is, will I ever be able to convince my mom that logging in without having a pin, without having a password, without having a memorized secret to use the NIST standard uh, mm-hmm. uh, version to express this, will we be able to convince people that that solution is actually secure because they no longer have a secret to memorize? Right. Well, I think it's going to take time. Hmm. Just like anything else, there's going to be an adoption period, yeah. right? Um, but I think within five years easily, you know, FIDO will be widely adopted and will just become the standard hmm. for, you know, certain types of authentication. But even with FIDO, you're still shifting the password further down the chain, hmm. right? So, like, you may not have a password for this website, but you still have a password for your phone. Or maybe use biometrics for your phone, but, like, you know, for some other device in the chain, you're still using a password yeah. or a PIN, or pin. you know? Yeah. So you're just kind of shifting where the password lies. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, hmm. you know? Um, and uh, that's one of the things that, you know, again, where I work today, uh, we see id theft we see abuse mm-hmm. and that also happens in close relations spouse partner yes. husband wife absolutely kids anyone with access to your office or your home and i'm afraid that in some cases if we even if we go for fido web both and that provides strong authentication at least from a technical perspective again we have the problem which is not sort of part of the threat model here and that mm-hmm. is like it is still easy for someone to 
abuse your credentials, be it uh, 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 especially if you have like a hard like key as an example. Right. Because again, there are those that have at physical access to it that are also willing to abuse it if they can. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, in a lot of ways, a lot of these technologies that we create do come from a position of privilege. Hmm. And there are social considerations and economic considerations that, you know, a lot of things like this don't necessarily account for. So yeah. I think, I think the domestic violence situations is a great example. Another one is, um, you know, like developing worlds where they may, they not necessarily have a smartphone or, yeah. you know, access to, uh, to things like that to enable things like FIDO or multi-factor hmm. authentication. Um, or even here in the U S you know, I say developing countries, but even here in the U S you know, I know people who don't have a mobile device. You know? Yeah. So they, I mean, they so, would have to use somebody else's phone. Access exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, there's both the technical challenge, the security challenge, the social challenges yeah. and the economic challenges. Yeah. So it's, it's not, you know, I don't think there's one, any one silver bullet for solving the problem. And if, if you want to bring it back to that level, passwords would be the most accessible. Hmm. So, yeah. And as you said, it's this easy, simple solution that everybody knows. Yes. It is the easiest and, and the easiest implement and the cheapest implement. So, so I think, the conclusion to this is we still got to do password con. Password con lives <laughs> for now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. And we'll see you back here in Las Vegas for next year, I guess, for B sites and the <laughs> password contract. Yeah, I hope so. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy. Absolutely, Pear. Loved it. Peace.